Good morning. This is the fourth Sunday that we have met in this way because of the uh, coronavirus. My guess is there will be at least two to three, maybe four more weeks where we uh, have to meet this way. But I miss the congregation. I miss the assembly. I miss you guys. My prayers is that this will be lifted from us and that God will do a marvelous work and that God will save souls because of this. People will be reminded of the fragility of life, how we just don't know what lies around the corner, that death is a penalty that all of us must pay because we're separated from the tree of life. In the Garden of Eden, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the free gift of God is life eternal in Jesus Christ. I'm thankful to those who have the technological wherewithal to uh, make this possible, to people like Shamron and James and to my wife Debbie and my daughter Tara and to those who have participated in, uh, in these uh, augmented services. Uh, Daniel Cawthon this coming Wednesday night. Dagan Hall is going to be doing a devotional talk. So I'm thankful to them for all their um, investment of time so that uh, we can make this available to you by means of the Internet. During the Second World War, there was a man who went around handing out little handheld mirrors. He gave out more than 300,000 little mirrors, and on the back of every single one of those mirrors, he wrote the words, John 3, 16. And every time he handed out a mirror... He said this to the recipient. He said, if you want to see who God loves, turn to the back side of this mirror and read this verse. John 3.16 has been called the heart of the Bible. Martin Luther called it a little Bible. And by that he meant this one little verse encapsulates or summarizes the entire word of God. It's been called the gospel in a nutshell. It's been called a love letter from God written with blood, the blood of the Son of God. If there was ever a verse that Satan hates, it's John 3.16. And this morning, I want us to reflect on the greatness of this verse. I want us to take this verse and analyze it, break it apart, and then at the end put it back together. I want to see this verse in its context. I want to plumb the depths of what this verse means. If there was ever a verse that has enlightened the pathway to heaven, this is the verse. The context of this verse is in the early part of the Gospel of John. There are four Passovers that are mentioned in the Gospel of John. John chapter 2, 13. John chapter 5, verse 1. John chapter 6, verse 4. John chapter 11, verse 55. John gives us a, a, an insight into the length of the ministry of Jesus. Three and a half years. And so Jesus is in Jerusalem for the Passover. And Nicodemus, who is a member of the Jewish Supreme Court... The Sanhedrin, that word means the 70, with the high priest being the tiebreaker, number 71. Nicodemus, being a member of that great council, came to Jesus by night. He had some questions that he wanted to ask Jesus. And during that meeting, Jesus quoted or Jesus spoke the words that are recorded in John 3.16. John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but shall have eternal life Jesus has this discussion with Nicodemus you cannot interpret John 3 16 while regarding its context please don't disregard what our Lord said in John 3 3 about being born again John 3, 5, about being born of the water and of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, verse 20, about those who by their lives, they hate the light because they won't come to the light because their evil deeds are going to be exposed. But those who do the truth come to the life, come to the light rather. John 3, 16 has to be interpreted 
in view of everything Jesus says in this chapter. John 3.16 mentions the greatest being in the universe, God himself. And the Gospel of John presents a wonderful picture of God. He's a creator, chapter 1. He's the one who sent John the Baptist and then later Jesus. He's a communicating God. He's a God, chapter 4, who seeks men who are willing to, to worship him in spirit and in truth. God wants honest people to search for him. And God is looking for those people. He is a seeking God. He is a God, chapter 5, verse 17, who is at work right now on the earth. He is a God who is the judge of all humanity, John chapter 5, verse 27. He is the God who is the Savior of all humanity, John chapter 17, verse 8. He sent Jesus so Jesus could be the Savior of the world. He is the greatest being in all the universe. And then we see hints in the Gospel of John what God was doing before creation ever occurred. John chapter 17, Jesus said that both he and the Father had glory before the world even began, that they were completely united and that they were completely bound together by a relationship that was rooted and grounded in love. And so unity and glory and love pre-existed creation. And that is the God that John is wanting us to know about, the God who loves the world. Not only do we have the greatest being in the universe, we have the greatest degree of love. The text says he so loved the world. If you go out on the street and you ask people to define love, frequently they would define love in terms of lust. Lust is about gratification. Lust cannot wait to be fulfilled. Lust cannot wait to be treated in a selfish manner. But God's love is completely different. God's love is not selfish. It is selfless. God's love gives. God's love sacrifices. He so loved the world. The word world is a metaphor. It stands for the people who have lived on this world, on this planet. God loved humanity. We were the ones who hated God. We hated his standards. We didn't want to go by his rules. We didn't want to live the way he wanted us to live. If it had been within our power, we would have killed God. If it would have been within our power to invade heaven and to overthrow God, we would have done so. And yet, despite being rebellious, and disobedient, God chose to love us. The book of Romans says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And so God loved us by giving, by sacrificing. And his love overcomes our hatred. It overpowers it. It destroys it. It transforms it into obedience, into devotion into faith. God loves the unlovely and the unloving. And we as his people, he calls us to do the same. Here we have the greatest sacrifice, not only the greatest, greatest being and the greatest degree, we have the greatest sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave who? Not an angel, not a a little baby that he created. God gave not just his, his son, his only begotten son. That phrase, only begotten, refers to the relationship that he and the father has. And it's mentioned several times in the, the gospel of John's account. He gave his only begotten son. God saw that sin rotted the inside of our soul. The sin and the guilt that it produces, the shame that it brings, was like a cancer, like a disease of the human heart. And it ate away and it demeaned us and it caused us to lose our dignity and the Godhood, the image of God that he imprinted on us when he created us. 
And so God did something about our greatest need. He offered forgiveness. Would you be willing to forgive someone who murdered a member of your own family? You reflect on that. And marvel at the love that God has for us. John 3 follows John chapter 2 where Jesus is in Jerusalem and he cleanses the temple and he overthrows tables. Coins are going everywhere. Animals are, are frightened. Jesus drives all of them out. He says, you take all these things away from here. The leaders then demanded, they answer Jesus, show us a sign. What sign will you do? that will show us the authority by which you do these things. And you remember what the Lord said? They did. They never forgot what he said. He said, you destroy this temple, and in three days I'll what? I'll raise it back up. Three years later, when uh, he's on trial, some false witnesses come in, and they say, well, this fellow said, I will destroy the temple, and then raise it up in three days. That's not what Jesus said. They twisted every single one of Jesus' words. They dogged him every step of the way. I would get a little frustrated by someone who follows me around and then takes my words and puts the worst possible connotation on my words to make me look bad. That's what they did to Jesus. And yet he patiently loved them. Our Lord knew even early in his ministry that the cross awaited him. You destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Chapter 2, verse 21. But this he spake of his body. Not a physical structure, but of his own body. And so Jesus knew that he was going to be murdered. I've been at the funeral home for one of my friends who was killed in a car wreck. And one of my classmates said he did not know what hit him. That can't be said of Jesus. He knew this was coming. He foresaw this. He came to earth knowing this was his divine destiny. And he died. But God raised him from the dead. Here we have the world's greatest sacrifice, the world's greatest miracle, the miracle of all miracles, power over death itself. God gave his only begotten son. And then we have embedded in this one verse, the greatest invitation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. What does John mean when he says, whoever believes in him? Most of us remember John 3.16. Not many of us remember John 3.14. For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have Eternal life. That's John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. You go back to Numbers chapter 21, where God punished the criticizing Jews wandering in the wilderness. They complained and they insulted God. And so in order to discipline them and punish them, God sent fiery serpents. Many people were bit. Some of them died. And they came to Moses, begged God to take away these serpents. But instead of taking away these venomous reptiles, Moses was instructed to make a bronze or a yeah, bronze serpent, lift it up on a pole, put it where everybody in the camp of Israel can see it. And when they're out gathering sticks, when they're out gathering manna, if they are bitten by the snake, if they wanted to be healed, all they had to do was look at the uplifted serpent. And that was the look of faith. That God had made a promise. God said, if you look to this serpent, you will be healed. 
And they were. So now our look of faith on the cross. When we look to the cross, we can be healed. I've had people tell me over the years, well, John 3.16 is the entire plan of salvation. Really? Would you interpret verse 16 while in complete disregard of John 3.3 3 and John 3.5 and John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21? John takes pains to define what he means by the term believing in him. And when he uses that term in a way to describe superficial faith, he tells you that superficial faith. faith. In the latter part of chapter 2, Jesus is doing miracles and many people believed in him, but Jesus didn't trust them. He didn't offer further disclosure because he knew what was in man. He knew what was, what was in man's heart. He didn't need testimony from anyone. Later in, in the Gospel of John, John chapter 12, many of the chief priests believed in him. They believed in Jesus, but they dared not confess him because the Pharisees had already put the word out. If you confess him, we'll excommunicate you from the synagogue. And then the Apostle John adds, adds this comment. They love the praise of man more than they love the praises of God. When John 3.16 mentions believing in him, John is describing a complete, wholehearted commitment to the personhood of Jesus. That whatever Jesus asks us to do, we're willing to do it. And John 3.16 has to be interpreted in light of what has been previously said. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus told Nicodemus and those bystanders, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom. Well, what does it mean to see the kingdom? He'll tell you. In verse 5, unless a man is born of the water and of the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. What does it mean to enter the kingdom? It means to see the kingdom. What does it mean to be born again? It means to be born of the water. That's gospel baptism and of the Holy Spirit. We are regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is like seed that lodges in our heart. And the Holy Spirit takes that seed and it germinates and it produces faith, a faith that is willing to do anything and everything that Jesus has asked us to do. What does it mean to believe in Him? It means to be born again. It means to be born of the water and the Holy Spirit. And when He says that when we do that, we shouldn't perish, that we will have everlasting life, that's what it means to be in the kingdom. That's what it means to see the kingdom. Well, let's not stop there. Jesus continues. Because later on, in verses 20 and 21, he says, everyone who practices evil hates the light. And he won't come to the light because he doesn't want his works reproved. People who are committed to a sinful lifestyle hate plain Bible preaching. Why? Because Bible preaching rebukes evil lifestyles. And people don't want to feel like they're being criticized. But the Word of God criticizes an evil lifestyle, and it defines how we should live. And so verse 21, Jesus says, whoever does the truth, whoever puts the truth into practice, they will come to the light. And when that happens, more of the darkness that's in our hearts is exposed. But yet we come to the light so our works can be made, made obvious. The works of the Spirit, the works of repentance, the works of faith, not works of human merit where we do certain things and we say, God, you owe me then, heaven. No. Works that demonstrate our love for God. Works that demonstrate that we believe in the name of the Son of God. And then John 3.16 warns of the greatest danger. Should not perish. 
Jesus talked about hell. In fact, he spoke about hell more than any other prophet in the Bible, more than any biblical writer. Hell must be so terrible that it prompted God to send his only begotten son to rescue us. It moved Jesus to willingly give up his glory in heaven and come to earth and suffer humiliation and degradation of every kind and to go to the cross so that we could be saved. On another occasion, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, said, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body, but they can't do anything to your soul. He said, don't be afraid of those people. Instead, you need to be afraid of the one who can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. The word that is translated hell is Gehenna. Gehenna was the Valley of Hinnom on the south side of Jerusalem. The Kidron Valley ran into the Valley of Hinnom. And it was in the days of Josiah that he knew the history of Jerusalem and he knew his ancestors who had worshipped false gods, who had sacrificed their own children, their own babies to the, to the god of, of the, uh, the Moabites, the god Chemosh or Molech. He had two different names. They burned them and offered as human sacrifices. And Josiah, he took the priests of those ungodly religions and he dug up their bones and he burned them. And he turned the valley of Hinnom into a garbage dump. Second Kings chapter 23 verse 10 said that Josiah defiled this valley. What does that mean? He said, here's where we're going to dump our garbage. And so if somebody had a donkey that died, loaded it onto an ox cart, carried it to the valley of Hinnom, and pushed it down the hill. And then flies would come and they would lay their eggs on the carcass. And then those eggs would hatch out. The maggots, those worms, would then consume the carcass. And that's what Jesus meant. He said, you don't want to go to a place where the fire is not quenched and where the worm dies not. That's a reference to those maggots in the metamorphic process of those flies being developed. The egg, the larvae, the pupae, and then the adult form. Don't be afraid of someone who can only kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can kill your body and your soul in hell. And so Jesus suffered separation from God on the cross. So much so that among his dying words, those seven sayings from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A quotation from Psalm chapter 22. And then the sun turned dark from noon until three in the afternoon. All over the Mediterranean world, historians record that darkness and record the earthquake that occurred when he also died. Jesus came so that we would not have to perish. But the flip side of that, we have the greatest promise that we shouldn't perish, but instead we can have eternal life. We can have eternal life because we've been forgiven, because we have been adopted as the children of God. To all who believe in Jesus, who are willing to commit to what the Lord says, we're offered this hope. Eternal life is not simply quantity of existence. It's the quality of existence that we have, a relationship with God the Father. Unending life, the people in hell are going to have that. Eternal life is... Therefore, is a relationship with God, eternal bliss, eternal joy, eternal ecstasy, eternal wonder, eternal worship and service to God. It's a spiritual life that flows out of our relationship with God. And folks, we can have that today. We can have that right now. I read about a little girl who was paralyzed from the waist down. And she saw that her dad was about to carry a, a box upstairs. And so she said, Daddy, I'll carry that package upstairs for you. And the dad was puzzled. He said, Honey, how can you carry that package? She said, Daddy, I'll hold the box 
if you'll carry me. He smiled, and that sweet gesture reminded him that God the Father can help us carry all the burdens while we have this greatest promise, the promise of eternal life. A former missionary to Brazil wrote about a teenage girl named Christina who lived in a small village in Brazil. She always talked about going to Rio. She was tired of her mom and her dad's rules. She had an independent streak. She was somewhat rebellious. She felt like her, the strict rules of her parents' home had cheated her out of the joys of life, and she longed for excitement. And so she decided to run away from home. And so Christina packed her bags and headed for the big city. That morning, her mother went into her room and she found Christina's bed empty. She knew immediately what had happened and where her daughter had gone. And her mom and dad knew about the dangers of the big city, so the father told his wife, he said, go look for our sweet daughter. And so the mom caught a bus to Rio de Janeiro. She stopped by a drugstore and where they had a photograph a photography booth. And she had a number of pictures of herself made. And then she took those pictures and she walked, traveled all throughout the city of Rio. And she left a picture on a bulletin board. She left a picture in a grocery store. She left her pictures all over the city. She never found Christina. And so filled with sorrow, she went back home heartbroken. Months later, Christina walked down the hotel room, walked down the stairs in the hotel room. She had been worn out by life. Every day had been like a year added to her life. She was tired of living that way. Her eyes were, her eyes were tired. Her heart was filled with pain and with loneliness and with fear. She wanted to go back home to her mom and dad and the safety that they had given her. But she said, it's just too late. They'd never want me back. When she reached the bottom of the stairs, she looked over the lobby and there was a mirror. And on top of the mirror, there was a small picture of her mother. She walked across the room. She took the photograph off the mirror. She turned it and looked on the back. And her mother had written these words. Whatever you have done, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And then the missionary says, and that's exactly what Christina did. That little story illustrates what God has done for us. We look at that compact mirror and we turn on the back side. There's written the word John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Beloved, you can have that this morning. If you're outside of the kingdom of God, you need to be born again. You need to be born of the water and the Holy Spirit. You need to be believe in, believing in Jesus Christ. You need to come to the light. You need to leave your evil lifestyle behind and come to the light so that your works can be done in view of the light and view of the kingdom of God. We beg you to come to Jesus. And if we can help you at any time, call us today. Call us this week. Call us at 3 a.m. in the morning and we can help you be right with God. Come to Jesus. Come to him this week. Come to him today. We're going to have the Lord's Supper here in just a minute. Terry Gross is going to be leading us. And as we all partake of the communion, realize that the entire body of Christ today is going to be doing this.